Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, this morning, uh, we are continuing our series looking at how do we enjoy God in every single part of our life. And so this morning, uh, we're going to continue that. And I'm going to kind of just jump right in this morning. It's going to go deep a little bit quick maybe than what we're used to. And that's okay. I'm kind of giving you the pre-warning now um, that that's what we're going to do. Uh, perhaps as followers of Jesus... There's been times in our lives where we've experienced the rush of new life with Jesus, when we first came to faith, when we have amazing moments with God. Uh, and we believe, and we, we know it's true in the Bible, that Jesus conquered sin and death, which he did. But our reality might be that perhaps we still feel in some way that we are enslaved to sin or that we're governed by fear or we're governed by, by sin in our lives. And we've stopped believing in the possibility that there can be something more, that there can be something better that we can experience in our life with God. Um, our experience is not what we thought it might be and we're left asking for or wishing or hoping for more. Uh, maybe for some of us, our life has turned into, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, a process of sin management strategies that we've reduced Christianity down to, I've got to do right things and try and be a good person for Jesus. And so our life has become a series of rules and regimes that we put in place in order to avoid sin in our life. Maybe even for some of us, we've given up on the idea that we can become more like Jesus, and we've become indifferent to the brokenness that Chappie Scott has talked about this morning that exists in our lives and in other people's lives in our neighbourhood. We've become indifferent to the holiness of God, and we kind of just go through life going, well, it's kind of just this now. Uh, I was expecting or hoping for more, uh, that I would enjoy my new life with God, but, but kind of this is the reality, and you just need to grit your teeth <coughs> and put up with it. Now, like I said, I'm being fairly direct this morning as we begin. Uh, maybe there's some here today. <clears throat> you would say you're a good person. You're friendly, kind. You're a follower of Jesus. But at home, when the kids are screaming and there's jobs to be done and you just want to break and you just want to put your feet up, maybe there's a temper in you that comes out and you're not a nice person to be around. Uh, maybe this is you. Um, you don't swear, you don't steal, you don't get drunk, you haven't been unfaithful to your spouse, but you've become prone to grumbling and whinging and you've kind of become this person that finds no joy in life anymore. There's no joy in serving God anymore. Uh, some of us, maybe this morning, have a secret thought life a fantasy world that we escape to. Uh, you wouldn't want anyone to know about what you think about. Uh, maybe even you're looking at pornography or whatever it is, uh, and perhaps you've put in rules and regimes to try and stop yourself doing that, but for whatever reason you haven't. Some of us this morning haven't had an easy life, and we've found in this world that there's things that can cheer us up. Um, these are good things, shopping, money, um, doing up your home, renovating the house, um, buying new clothes, thinking about your appearance and what you look like, going to the gym. All of these things are fine in of, in of, of themselves, but for you they've become something more. They're an escape, maybe even an addiction or a fixation. They've become a treasure for you and that thing is more valuable than ever anything else in this world. <clears throat> Some of us have hard jobs. You do a good job at your very difficult job. <clears throat> but in your job, you experience things that aren't good. And maybe you've turned to alcohol or something else to numb the pain and to forget what you've seen. You, you kind of self-medicate in some kind of way. And you work so hard and you do so much good and you kind of deserve this one little vice in your life. You, you need it to cope. Others, 
you're hard workers, you're diligent, you're well liked, but at your core is a deep, deep need to have to prove yourself to people. And it's unhealthy for you. Now, you're driven by this debilitating need to be liked and it pushes you on, but you're not free. You have periods of self-loathing where you go into these deep, dark kind of moods. <clears throat> Maybe in your marriage, feels a bit mundane, routine, and life's busy. And for whatever reason, there's a person at work who you really enjoy being around. And so you deliberately go past their desk. You, you, you create opportunities to work with them. You don't want an affair or anything like that, but you, you love it when they smile at you. you. You love it when they give you attention. They really listen to you, and that makes you feel good. And you wonder what might have been in your marriage. I think the reality of sin in our lives leaves us questioning life sometimes. Could there be more than this, or is just this how it's supposed to happen? That we just settle for this, this is how it is. We can't conquer, we can't defeat. This is kind of the reality of sin in the world, and so we just grit our teeth and try our best. We hoped things could have been better, we expected more, but this is now the reality for us. Uh, my daughter got a uh, Christmas card. I won't tell you which one. I've scrubbed her name off the image. One of my kids got this Christmas card a couple of years ago. Um, I'll see if I can get it to click to the next screen. Maybe we'll have to... Would you be able to click that on? Thanks, Bruce. Um, I've removed the kid's name, uh, but this kid described himself, and I'm adding him. I'm not, I'm not telling you which kid, but I'm adding the kid down the bottom, Owen, not our Owen at Rivers Baptist. This is another Owen at another school. He described one of my kids as his mortal enemy and his mum made him write a Christmas card to everyone in the class. He said, I will, but not that kid, my, my kid. Uh, so he did, as his mum asked, and he said, to my kid's name, he crossed out, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He's like, no Merry Christmas, no Happy New Year to you from Owen, grumpy face, angry at you. Maybe we feel like sin is our mortal enemy, that, that sin is coming to get us, that it's only intending evil, it's, it's steering us toward hatred and anger, and we've got to fight against it, we've got to rage against it. Maybe we even feel like we are our own worst mortal enemy. We want better in our lives. We say, I'm a good person. I try really, really hard. But then we have these moments of weakness where we go, I'm not good enough. I failed again. I'm my own worst mortal enemy. Is there any hope of any more? Now, Jesus asked his disciples to pray with him in the garden before he was arrested, before he went on trial. He asked them to come and, and to pray with him. I think they were really willing. They wanted to follow their master. Their master said, come and pray with me, and they were obedient to him. And they tried really, really hard. And Jesus says this on the next slide. Thanks so much, Bruce. He says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Jesus says this, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus went and found them asleep. We experience that, don't we? We, we kind of go, yes. I'll do that for you, Jesus. Yes, I'm determined. I won't do that sin again or whatever it might be. And our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. Well, the good news this morning is that Jesus doesn't write us off. Uh, we should have hope this morning that this kind of picture that's been painted for us is not the normal and should not be the norm in Christian life. There is a possibility of more with God. So this morning, these verses from Hebrews chapter 12 says this. Uh, this is Jesus' invitation to us, Paul's invitation, or the, the writer of the letter of Hebrews. This is what scriptures are urging us to do this morning. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, 
throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the mark the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith Jesus has pioneered he has perfected he is perfect in living a life of faithfulness and Colossians chapter 1 says that he's supreme. He's the image of God. He is perfect. He is the one. John chapter 6 says he is the holy one of God. And these verses on the screen, they remind us that in this journey, it's our job to fix our eyes on Jesus. He's the perfect one. He's the one that's lived the perfect life. And he's the one that calls us on and helps us to keep going. You want to read a theology book on this? This is called Sanctification. How our, in our lives, we are made right by God through what Jesus has done, but Jesus now helps us to become more and more like him. So we want to have hope this morning. Jesus is a pioneer in this. He's got to the finish line. He's perfected this, and he's encouraging us on. We can have hope in this journey of a lifetime, that we will become more and more like him. And so this morning, uh, thanks Bruce, we want to look to Jesus and we want to throw off everything that hinders. He's the perfect one. He's the one that we keep our eyes on and so we look at him and throw off what's holding us back. So this morning, we want to look at Jesus and then look at our wallet and if whatever you've got in here, if, if you've fallen for the lie, if I've fallen for the lie this morning that money can buy you happiness, that it can get you security, then this morning we're being invited to look at Jesus and discover that he is a greater treasure than any amount of money that we can own. And this morning when we look at that, there's nothing wrong or bad with money, but this, if this has become something to us that controls us, then we throw it away. We get rid of it. We, we look at Jesus and, and allow him to transform who we are. You can't take your eyes off this. If it's the first thing you look at in the morning, if it's the last thing you're looking at at night, and there's nothing wrong with a mobile phone. But if you're looking at this and it's, it's pulling you in a certain direction and it's pulling you away from Jesus, Jesus says, look back at me. Come and look at me. Discover life in me. If there's things you're looking at on this that's tearing you away from who I am, then throw it away. You're okay. Maybe you need to limit time on it. Maybe you need to set limits. Now, we do it for our kids. I do it for myself now. Rules and regulations won't save us, but Jesus wants to look at him, and when we see something that's become a distraction or an idol or more precious than him, throw it away. If, uh, if something that you drive or, or your house has become so precious to you, it's become your greatest treasure and more than anything else, you live for this car, you live for this motorbike, you, you live for this house and it's become something so significant, it's taken your eyes off Jesus. Jesus says, look back at me, I can help you to become more like me and so throw it away. You should have sat in the front row today. You've got all my money. You've got my car keys. You've got my phone. If your diary, what you have to do this week, governs and defines who you are, doing these jobs makes me into a great person. Jesus says, what you do doesn't define who you are. I define who you are and let that shape what you do. So throw it away. I think Graham got us to do that last week. Tear up the to-do list. Who we are is defined by him, not by what we do. This is pretty good jacket, hey? Got a few more things in it. If you look in the mirror at home and what you see you don't like, and when you look in the mirror, you, you see who you are and, and you hate that, you, you don't like that, then Jesus says... Throw it at you all panicked then, didn't you? He says, place it down gently on the front seat of the auditorium. He wants us to throw that away. 
He wants us to look at him. We become his image. Don't look at yourself in the mirror and loathe yourself and hate yourself. Look at him. Discover that he loves you and let his love for you govern what you think about yourself. <laughs>